be a man on a tightrope, just very gingerly putting his one foot in front of the other, just recalibrating his balancing pole, a little shift to the left, a little more, too much inclination, and will drag him off the tightrope. A little bit of overcompensation to the right, and he would fall off that side. What we don't see, there are already 800 of these steps that he's taken before. There are another thousand to follow, and there are the Niagara Falls beneath him. It's Nick Wallander tide roping across the Niagara Falls on 15th of June, 2012, 1,800 feet on the tide rope, and 100,000 people watching live, and many, many more on television. Why are we so fascinated with finding balance? It is difficult, but it feels good when we achieve it. And it does because there is the risk that you may fall off to either side of the tightrope. There is no point in leaning all the way you can to one side or the other, because either side is just as risky as the other. It is all about finding the perfect balance. It is risky, not always as risky as falling into the Niagara Falls, but even if you think about just balancing along on the curb at the street, you just don't want to fall off, you might hurt yourself. So there is a lot of skill, there is a certain danger. Now I'm in the business school, I'm not into acrobatics and I'm not into circus. And sometimes I have to remind myself of that because the differences aren't always that clear. So why do we care about balance in business? Certainly, those greedy corporations that we've learned to loathe, especially in the past few years of the financial crisis, they are these single-minded entities hell-bent on maximizing profit. Why should they, why should we think about balance? Actually, there are many, many more organizations that have to balance very divergent demands on their work many more than we think probably, and they fall into two camps. There is one group that is basically forced to, do, to balance those different demands, and although they are obviously struggling with it, there are recently a large number of organizations who choose to put themselves in the same position. Why would you do that, and how do they do that? Just a couple of examples. Healthcare costs, a perennial problem. Think about balance. You lean all the way to one way, you focus on perfect patient care that may lead to an unsustainable healthcare system and the healthcare system collapses. Focus all the way on the money aspects of providing that healthcare. Lots of people will be deprived of the best treatments available and maybe some people will be deprived of treatments overall. You have to find the balance between the two of them. Look at law, accounting, professions that have a public service duty. Lawyers need to serve their clients, but they also need to uphold the rule of the law. And as we're nowadays talking about law firms, they also have to pay some attention to the profits to their own organization. So they actually have to balance three different impacts on their work. What if they go off too far either side? They need to find that balance. Utilities companies, strictly regulated. They have this public service duty that we all need gas, water, electricity, telecommunications, critical infrastructures that keep our societies running. Yet in the wake of privatization, they're also profit-making entities that compete against each other for market share, for profits, and so on. And the typical solution to this has been to break up these organizations so different parts, different units, focus on different parts of the business. The infrastructure, highly regulated, don't compete. Service providers, on the other hand, they are the ones competing. Now that's a little bit like taking Nick Wallander's balancing pole, cutting it in two and giving him two little sticks. That's not very useful for finding your balance. Now why do organizations choose to put themselves into this position where they have to balance two separate and contradictory impacts. Social entrepreneurship microfinance is one idea. 
where you set up banks whose primary mission is not profit-making, but is social. You have banking on the one side, these institutions whose sole purpose is to make money of interest and of the clients they serve, and on the other hand, there is the social mission, the, the charitable mission of development workers. Those two make very, very unlikely bedfellows. Yet, there are organizations who are addressing problems of poverty and rural development through bringing those very divergent and very contradictory sets of influences and expectations together. There is some creativity in addressing some of the most critical pr problems of the world at the moment through this type of design thinking. There are organizations who address climate change, partly publicly funded because they provide a public good by providing some advice on how to equip your houses with better insulation, making them more energy efficient, yet they may provide for profit services to then install these kind of uh, facilities themselves. On the one hand, they make some profit, but the entire society benefits. They have a social component as well as a profit-making component. Yet these things are very different to balance because in these organizations, it's not just that people outside the organization have different ideas about what they are about. Is this a charity? Is this a business? They don't fit either box neatly, so it's very difficult to balance and reconcile those in, um, expectations. But at the same time, it's also difficult for the people inside the organization. Do we hire business people to look after the commercials? Do we hire scientists to look after kind of the public good and the impact that, that we're having? It is a little bit like these utilities companies being broken up because you have these then have these different conflicts and tensions within the organizations and they're likely to get into some fights. Going back to the earlier example, listen to some chats, what doctors have to say about their managers, what managers have to say about doctors, what lawyers have to say about their managers, what lawyers have to say about their clients. Usually it seems this isn't going on very, very easily. So some of these organizations have actually said, look, we're not going to hire people who fall into one or the other camp. We're trying to find those rare people who actually bring all this together within their, within their person. We're looking at microfinance bankers. We're looking for social entrepreneurs who bring all of this together. Now that is a little bit like taking Nick Wallander's balancing pole and reducing those contradictions and making it very, very short. So he now has a single one, but a very, very short one. Because when we're not aware of those contradictions, we actually forget that there is something we have to balance. Other social entrepreneurs, and we shouldn't think that they all deal with these issues somewhere far out there. Coal caps melting, rural development in remote areas. No, there are social entrepreneurs who look at workforce integration, integrating homeless people into the workforce, um, former convicts, for example. Again, setting up organizations who are there to make a profit, but who do so through a charitable mission. Now, the question is, how do they do that? And then the final one is, work-life balance. This isn't just about big organizations doing all these things. It's us, personally. How much, there is only 24 hours in a day. How many of them do we spend on work? How many of them do we spend living? How do we find that balance? And that's the big challenge, is that organizations so far have been looking at balancing their organizations by dividing them into different camps. There's the money on one end, there's the life quality on the other. There's regulation on one, competition on the other. Healthcare on one, cost efficiency on the other. It doesn't really work anymore in many contexts because we often have to make decisions quite spontaneously and these decisions have to be made within our heads. And that makes things a lot more tricky. Now, based on some research I've done with colleagues here at Aston, we've come up with a model that helps individuals finding that kind of balance for personal lives, but also for their organizational purposes. And it's based, it based on three steps, and the first one is divide. Because different people have different expectations about what your organization is about, you need to divide those different things that you do in front of different people. Imagine you're a hospital patient lying in your bed. 
You don't want your doctors discussing the costs of your treatment by your bedside. They usually do that somewhere else. Likewise, we're going to work and we're protecting our homes largely from the pressures of work. We find these different spaces. Now we may these take these things for granted and that's the natural way of doing things, but actually we can use those mechanisms to our advantage. Because our human brain is very clever and it's actually being re-engineered as we've just seen, so it, it's protected. Um, so we can put on these different thinking caps and different hats. We can be a hard-nosed business manager during the day and a caring parent at night. But changing spaces, allocating different times to different activities, changing dress between different activities helps us actually accommodate these, converse, uh, these contrasts and get ourselves in the same frame of mind. Some recent psychological research actually shows that these kind of situational cues, what we're wearing, where we are, who we are with, affects what takes priority in, your, in our minds. So it is important that we divide. But in difference to what we've seen earlier about organizations assigning work to different groups of people, this is us assigning different parts of our work different aspects of our lives to different areas, times, and purposes. And that has the important advantage that we ourselves can connect these things again. It's not bringing together large numbers of people who have been doing different things separately, it's just us connecting different areas, different aspects of our lives. And that means that we can actually benefit from having both of these things together. Think about efficient healthcare. It would be great if we could achieve that. Think about the social entrepreneurship through microfinance. It's not just important to understand how the, the loan works and how the aid works. In an ideal world, those two should actually feed off each other, balance each other out, but also create a better outcome because we can make more informed decisions in where to invest, who gets the loan based on the needs of aid if we think about workforce integration. If it's a single person thinking about both aspects, the charitable aspect of workforce integration and the business outcome of creating a profit, you can actually create these positive feedback loops and saying, well, if we do well on our profits, we can reinvest that money into upskilling the staff we have. By upskilling the staff we have, we can produce better products or services and so on and so forth, and the cycle becomes self-sustaining. The danger with connecting, though, is that if we overemphasize the similarity between those contrasts, if we forget that we're actually balancing very different things, and they become one in our minds, that is when we ourselves equip ourselves with this very short balancing pole. Because when we don't think about the contrast between the two is, we'll make a decision, and we'll just slightly step off shift our weight of that, that tightrope. And the next time we have a similar decision, we'll base that decision on what we did last time. Oh, last time that was okay. Uh, just as an exception, we'll go to a slightly more extreme. And because we're forgetting about this contrast, our balancing pole is starting to shift. And we've seen examples of that in recent corporate scandals. Um, Enron is the most public or noteworthy of that, where people did, for example, forget about the duty to the public they had, a professionals, and the duty to their clients they had. So every decision tilted a little bit further towards the benefits of the client, and in the end, we know what the outcome was. They clearly weren't on the tightrope anymore. That is why we need a third aspect to this. When we bring things together that don't really belong together, which is at the core of design thinking, when those things come together, we still need to delineate them as different and as contradictory. Number one, that allows us to recalibrate the balance of those different elements. It prevents an excessive incursion of one set of demands onto another. Let's go back to the example about work-life balance. Yes, we can connect. You can Take your kid to or your family to the office Christmas party. If your child is sick, you can work from home. That is perfectly acceptable. Would you do so at the dinner table? 
Probably not, because that is an area you're protecting. You're delineating exactly how far you're willing for work to intrude your family time and your family life. Now, if you think this is blatantly obvious, how many of you keep their smartphone on their bedside table? How many of you check their emails before you get out of bed in the morning? How many of you work in the living room while the telly is on? Work and life become completely indistinguishable. You have nothing to balance. The problem with that is that when this connecting happens in our head, when we keep the gates open between the different areas of our life, that delineation needs to happen in our head as well. The good thing about these compartmentalized organizations where different people do different things is when they come out of balance, one of them will say, wait a minute, this is not what we signed up for. And they will have a proper fight, which isn't often pretty, but it reestablishes the balance. Now, if you have to do that yourself, you have that little conversation with the voices in your head. Personally, I got along very well with the voices in my head, so it takes a very artificial step to create that kind of delineation. For example, you can have meetings amongst doctors, GPs, about which patients they refer to hospital, what cost implications that has. So you artificially create a situation in which you have to justify the balance you struck on an individual decision to other peers. What investment decisions did our microfinance institution make last week? How strong was the profit component? How strong was the development component? If you force people to explicate what their balance in that decision was, then you can start recalibrating. The important thing with that is, not every decision you have to have perfect equilibrium. It's okay to favor one or the other, even in a couple of decisions, but in the large scheme of things, you need to come out back in balance. And it's cycling through those three steps, separating, connecting, delineating. That these things that we're bringing together in, through design thinking that don't really belong together, are distinguished as separate and as different. They're brought together so they can creatively feed off each other. And it's only that creative friction when we recognize them as not naturally fitting together. When that abrasion creates light rather than heat, that is when we notice the difference and that's when creativity springs. So when you go away tonight, whether you're running a business or just your personal life, think about separating, connecting, delineating. Step out into the tightrope. It's your turn.